Welcome, I'm John Caldera, president of the Independence Institute and your devil's advocate. We're gonna talk about, well, microgrids later. Just trust me, you're gonna like that. But first, a little pop culture. The Simpsons is, what, 30 years old, and finally the inside story comes from, of other people, this Boulderite, Matt Clickstein. Thank you for being here. Hey, thanks for having All me, right. appreciate it. So you helped co-author uh, Springsteen Confidential. Close, but no Close. cigar. Springfield Confidential. Springsteen, Springfield. <laughs> yeah, I do it's like early. Bruce Springsteen, though. Actually, that would be better. Yeah, yeah, that would probably sell a lot more books. Yeah, this is the first book that actually came from inside... It um, is. Uh, Inside the Simpsons. Yes, um, there have been obviously a number of other books that have come out over the years. Really great books, some that deal with the math of the Simpsons, some that deal with the religion of the Simpsons, books written by fans of the show. This is the first time that someone from inside the show, especially as high up as Mike Reese, who's written for the show since it started, created many of our favorite characters, still works on the show to this day, um, was involved with. This is basically Mike Reese's memoirs of a lifetime, quote unquote, 30 years of working on the show. I helped right. him to. You were form. eight years old when this thing started. I was. I was. So, I was Lisa's age. Yes. Right, so Bart I, was older than I. <laughs> I remember. I, and uh, I remember how revolutionary Simpsons was. It was different. Yeah. I'm a South Park fan. Sure. We'll always, as live and die. Live and die South Park. Yep. And you know, you probably get this a lot. I, the first ten seasons, I could probably. Yeah, excellent. I I can give you <laughs> give you it all. People know it all. Right. <laughs> Me, it's just as you get older, you watch less stuff. Uh, and I I haven't seen it as as much recently, but. No show has lasted this long. No. First of all, what's what's the secret? Um, we've talked about this a lot uh, in articles that have come up about the show, um, and obviously all in the book itself, because that's that's the big question. It is now the longest running primetime scripted American show in television history, beat out only by things like soap operas, news shows, sports, right. obviously. Um, it works because it's a it's a great group of people. They all really love each other. Even some of That's the a Hollywood answer. <laughs> no, oh really, my god, you know, he I've, was I've so been, good to I've work been with. To, He's I've, such a genius. He really to... pulls out everything. <laughs> no, from no, the no. Scene. Genius has nothing to do yeah, with being a good yeah, guy. Yeah, Those yeah. two things are completely different. In fact, usually they're they're uh, in conflict with each other. No, truly. Um, uh, even some of the, the the newer guys and gals on the show have been there for 15, 20 years yeah. now, and they all really care about each other. They all really care about the show. And we have, just real quick to give you an example, we have a story in the book, and I've heard this kind of thing before, but there was, there was someone involved many years ago who was a great writer, very funny, but they said, you know what, you're a bit of a jerk. Uh, you know, you need to stop being so much of a jerk. He said, let me ask my wife about that. Went home over the weekend, came back and said, gonna have to leave the show, guys. I can't stop being a jerk. And Tina Fey talks about this in her book. Other uh, Amy Poehler, a lot of really great writers and producers and such over the years have said, talent is one thing, but if you can't get along with somebody, especially on a TV show, that you're up till three in the morning finishing the script before it's due, um, and you want to punch that person in the face, you got to get rid of them. And a, a number of people say this. So I do think that has a lot to do with The Simpsons' success. So who was success. that guy? What? Who was it? Who do we oh, want to punch in the face? Irrelevant. Irrelevant. Oh, very irrelevant. <laughs> it's in the, buy the book. Buy the what, book. <laughs> what surprised you the most? I mean, since you had a, you're diving into the beginning of yeah. it, the mid. What surprised you the most of this, the show? Wow, nobody's asked me that uh, before. Um, really, just how hard they work. I mean, they really, and I've, I've actually had the opportunity to go to the writers' room. They actually have multiple writers' room. It goes through a process like a factory line. So they, they are going through every single script. 15, 20, 30 times. We even have a layout in the book as far as the process that every single script goes through. And it will change 98 to 100% before it gets to the show, even when they're still sweetening sound and things like that, they're making changes. So they're making sure every single line, every single word, every single joke has, has been read, has been gone over, has been rewritten 15, 20 times. And the amount of work and time that they put into it is astounding. You know that a show like that, they're obviously gonna put a lot of time and energy into it. But to actually be there, to see it, to hear these stories from people like Mike Reese and Al Jean, who's been running the show since 2001, talk about just how much they put into this show. It's astounding. I mean, it's amazing they have families and kids at all and that they even take vacation or go anywhere. Who's, who's the coolest guest star? Because they always get a guest voiceover, whether sure. it's Sting or Ringo or somebody. Who, who are they like, oh my God, we got, we got this guy. You know, I, I know this might be a, a weird answer to give, but Albert Brooks. Albert Brooks really? has been on the show so many different times. He's played so many different characters. And when I interviewed Judd Apatow for this book, who was nice enough to do the forward, he was sort of around in the periphery when the show was really coming up, and he was coming up, and he worked on another show that Mike and his partner at the time, Al Jean, created called The Critic with John Lovitz. Uh, Judd Apatow wrote for that show. It was one of his first shows. But uh, Judd uh, had told me that 
uh, some of the uh, some of the uh, you know dialogue and voices that uh, Albert Brooks had recorded were actually getting passed around in Hollywood at the time in the late '90s and early 2000s as sort of a bootleg comedy thing. And Al Jean told me, true, they usually make sure that these voice actors are being as specific to the script as possible. When Albert Brooks comes on, they just let him riff. Oh, really? They, yeah, they just let him Robin go. Robin Williams style. But, yeah, exactly. And Apatow did tell me, and I've heard this from other people too. They would pass around. People would pass around bootlegs of Albert. Brooks recording for The Simpsons, just as though people were listening to it. Yeah, like some riff that that uh, Robin Williams or someone might be doing. So yeah, you guys met with Governor Polis. We did to meet with to Governor tie, Polis to tie, tie this in because he's a fan of Mike Reese. He's a fan of The Simpsons and Mike Reese. Yes, uh, I had Mike Reese coming out for Conference of World Affairs over at CU that they do every year there. Sort of a showcase of different intellectual panels and things, people talking about world problems and pop culture and anything else. Mike was coming out, and right around that same time that I was asked to help bring Mike out and produce some events for Conference of World Affairs, I saw that Polis was reading to a group of kindergarten kids one of Mike Reese's children's books, because he's also written 20 children's books. I hit up uh, Polis's office. I said, Mike Reese is coming to town. Would you like to have me? him. Uh, Polis's people jumped at the opportunity. We went and spent a good 20, 30 minutes with Governor Polis. And he was, we were surprised, he was the biggest Simpsons fan you ever no, met. That doesn't he surprise knew me at everybody all. from the show. He was quoting that the show. Doesn't surprise he was showing his all. tweets. It was like being with this little kid who was yeah. who was, who was was fanboying out on Mike Reese. It was adorable and hilarious. Polis couldn't have been nicer. He was a great guy. Um, and, um, you know, there's even some rumors, some possibilities. I can't really speak too much on it, but, you know, maybe at some point later down the road, Polis might even pop onto the show at some point. I can't <laughs> can't uh, can't guarantee or or decline that, but um, deny that. But you know, you never know. They de he definitely had a good time with Mike Reese. So <laughs> All right, there's also the, the the politics behind it. I'm not talking about uh, social politics. I'm talking about Hollywood politics. Sure. That you've got to um, you, you got to get through a season. You got to get this. I know that they were a hit, and then they took pay cuts, and they're still on Fox. Now, Disney, I think, owns Fox, which means they, they own all the Simpsons. They do. I don't know, which means when they start their streaming service, you'll be able to watch all the Simpsons. Uh, that makes fun of, 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 of Walt Disney all the time. Yep, so, and Fox. Yeah, and Fox. Yeah. Um, is this in the, in the book as well, just it the is. politics of, of how you get this going? Because I remember watching the original Simpsons on... Oh my God! I'm blanking out on her name. Uh, the Tracy Ullman. Tracy show. Ullman on Tracy Ullman's show, and it was weird and funny. Um, and like any other show, it takes time for the characters to kind of mm -hmm. set in. Uh, what were the politics to get it off the ground? Well, you have to remember when Fox first started, it was it was diametrically opposed to what it is now. There was actually a really great book. I can't remember the person's name, but that just came out about In Living Color, another show that was really big right around the same time that The Simpsons was coming to Fox. When Fox started, it was considered an alternative network. It was this group of brash young people who were trying to create an alternative to the huge behemoth of ABC, NBC, and CBS. So they were bringing in things like In Living Color, one of the first, if not the first, sketch comedy show on a major network that was predominantly an African-American cast and certainly African-American yeah. behind the scene. They had for a little while the Joan Rivers show, which was a big <laughs> deal to have you know, a, a female comic who was running her own talk show. They had Married with Children. Fox was the punk. Fox was the rebel. And so, of course, what else should go on there? Not only this incredibly irreverent, politically subversive cartoon series, but really you have to remember, too, the first cartoon series during prime time since maybe the 1960s or 70s with the Flintstones. So everything they were stop, doing was very different. Stop there for a second, because yeah. what was different about that, Simpsons made a delineation that animation is for adults. Yeah. You know, before that, it, it was always kid stuff. It was always kid stuff, except the comic book world and... And, and the very earliest cartoons ever. A lot of people don't realize yeah. that, but the very yeah. earliest cartoons were for adults. Um, you watch some and, of the Woody Wookbecker cartoons. Well, no, even, even, even way before that. We're going back to like Windsor McKay and that kind of yeah. thing. It was it was like going and seeing a vaudeville. It was like going and seeing Broadway. It was something that you because got you dressed saw, up for. You yeah, saw in the theater. It, you yeah. saw it in the yeah, theater. The very it, earliest right. cartoons. Yes, it came absolutely. on before the, yeah. the movie. And even before the Simpsons, you have to remember, we did. You did have Ralph Bakshi. You did have you know R. Crumb and you right. know Fritz the Cat. You did have. But that know, was alternative stuff. If you yeah, if true. you were into Fritz the Cat, yeah. you you were off there. You're yeah. on a college campus. 
Mike's place. Twisted Animated Film right. Festival. Uh, right around the same time, you also had things like uh, Roger Rabbit was coming out. You had things like what MTV was doing with Liquid Television. So you got Beavis and Butthead, and you had shows like this. Right. There was really an animation renaissance happening between 1988 and 1995, I'm going to say. Even what Nickelodeon was doing at the time, and I wrote a book about Nickelodeon as well before this one, with their Nicktoons block was very different. I mean, they were putting Ren and Stimpy up for kids at that time. And the only reason they had to go to Nickelodeon was because there really wasn't anywhere else to go at that time. Now you have Adult Swim and you have online and all these streaming services. Now, Simpsons wasn't necessarily the first to do this, but they definitely helped popularize it and they certainly showed there's money here. And then everything else came from that, absolutely. Another reason probably why it's so successful, they were really the first, not the first to do what they did, but the first to really popularize it. And they helped to make Fox happen for good or ill, the way that South Park helped to make Comedy Central happen. Let's bring it to the, to the business of, of what you do, because I'm always sure. curious about this. You live in Boulder. I do. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, and you make a living doing writing. You yes. write comic books. You write these books. You write scripts. Yeah. Why aren't you in Hollywood that in order to make this work, you got to be schmoozing all the time. In order to make money in the entertainment world, you are a used car salesman. Absolutely. You are making connections. 100%. You are going to parties. Yep. You're talking to people you don't want to talk to because you might need them, they might need you. Absolutely. What, what the hell are you doing here? Um, simply put, I can't stand LA. I think it's a terrible place filled with terrible people. There were so many times where I would sit back and say, I can't believe someone actually just said that. I can't believe that actually just happened. It almost seems like they're trying to emulate this kind of scene that you read about or see movies about, movies like The Player or uh, you know, Sunset <laughs> Boulevard or whatever it might be. I mean, there's a reason there's all these books and movies that keep coming out about what a horrible, terrible place Hollywood is. Because it's a horrible, terrible place. And it just, it really honestly, especially this generation, seems like they're almost trying to be that way. And I just couldn't stand it. I couldn't stand the traffic. I couldn't stand the lack of parking. Your life is about your car. And it just really is awful people. I've honest, I've said this before. I honestly think that if you raise your kids in that area there, especially the, the sort of Hollywood media, creative industry world there, <laughs> which is really the engine of that place, you should, it should be child abuse. I mean, it's a terrible place. And we see that, you know, all these kids who, are, you know, come from these backgrounds of families that are, you know, actors and actresses and producers, stuff, they all end up, you know, becoming drug addicts and whatever it is until they go to rehab and then they get to make movies of their own later on. But, um, no, I just, I couldn't stand it. I couldn't stand L.A. the whole time I was there. I went to film school at USC. I worked in L.A. for years, and I was successful right away. I sold a TV show to National Lampoon right out of school when I was 21. And I was optioning scripts. I was working for different magazines and newspapers. I was not doing the working three jobs right. you know, as a waiter or whatever and, and crossing my fingers. I was successful. But and now, I still left. <laughs> at 38, you're the old man. I am the old I man. I love yeah. this, yeah. by the way. I love everybody it's getting old. It's not so old. great. I just want you to lose your hair next, and life <laughs> yeah. will be good for me. And so <coughs> you're dealing with a bunch of 20-somethings who run the industry. Yeah. And by the way, in my world of politics, you go out to D.C., it's 20-somethings yeah. who run Media everything. Media, too. No, right. Everything is, everyone is between 25 and 28. And once you're over 28, you're, you're the old man or the old woman in the room. And nobody wants to talk about the ageism that's all over these industries, but they're there. <laughs> so... Well, so you're, you're hiding out in Boulder, yeah, <laughs> and you still make a living doing this. It I can do, be done. Just barely. Yeah, look, I, I lived in Boulder a few years ago. I absolutely loved it. I've lived all over the country. I've lived in New York three different times. I've worked there. I've lived everywhere that you can live all over the country. I worked uh, for about three years for a show on Food Network as a producer, traveling around and doing things for them. And meanwhile, I would write for different magazines and newspapers and work on these different books and whatnot because they're basically remote. And Boulder was my favorite part of the country. And so I actually moved back to this area about two years ago with my wife because um, she loved it here too. I would rather, yes, it's a lot harder to do the kind of work that I want to do, but I would rather live where I want to live where it's beautiful, people are friendlier, there's not as much traffic or yeah. parking problems. Yeah, Boulder's yeah. changing a lot oh, the last tell me couple years. I, yeah, I was raised it's better here. than L.A. You, still. You, you people are turning <laughs> my state into California, well, truth, but I'll, I'll fight with you on See, I really hide even here. Truth be told, I actually live in Lyons, and before that I was yeah. in Louisville. So I'm not, I'm, I'm, I say Boulder because it's a little All easier. All right, people want to get, get yeah. the book sure. any place. Springfield Confidential. Springfield Confidential. Terrific. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Stay tuned.